Thank you so much. This is probably going to be totally different than the last presentation, which was awesome. Um, before I came to grad school, I was a community organizer, so I would train crews of activists going out into LA to advance social justice. So when I got to grad school, I was like, it's fine, I can take on a section, like I can speak in front of a group and, and not die. Um, and since I've spent the last four years teaching, I've noticed more and more connections between the work that I did as a community organizer and the work that I do in the classroom. And I also study community organizing. Um, so I kind of consistently draw these connections. And I think that when we look at teaching from a community organizing perspective, it enables us to facilitate uh, more empowerment and put students first and uh, really have students lead in the classroom. Um, I'm going to talk about kind of three things today. I'm going to talk about mass mobilization as a framework for broad-based classroom participation. I'm going to talk about deep relational organizing as a mentorship strategy and to scaffold that mass mobilization. And I'm going to talk about what a perspective on power can contribute to how we understand our role in the classroom. Um, first, I think it's important to think about kind of some of the similarities between organizing and the classroom. In both of these contexts, we're working towards common goals. Um, and we as teachers and organizers working with groups of activists aren't necessarily better or smarter at doing these things. We just have more advanced skills. And it's about passing on those skills to another group of people and working with people to kind of work, work towards those shared goals. So in community organizing, there are kind of two broad paradigms. We have mobilization and organization. And mobilization is what you're thinking about when you think about big protests, um, huge online actions, basically getting a lot of people involved. And this is the framework that I use to think about how I get big classes of students involved. And it really involves reducing the barrier to entry. Um, so there's a couple things to think about here. Um, and the first one is that students face a number of different barriers to entry, and we don't always see what those are. So as instructors, we of course pay attention to um, the obvious ones, like if you're teaching an 8 a.m. class, you know that some students face the barrier to entry that they don't like to get up in the morning. <laughs> and finding ways to overcome that is really important. Um, so coming in with a lot of energy if you're at an 8 a.m. slot, which I always am, um, is really important. Um, and that's true in organizing, too. To get people riled up for a protest and excited to be there, you have to like really bring it. Um, and then thinking about other barriers to entry that you don't necessarily see. Um, I have a student in one of my classes who is a non-traditional student. She's much older than most of the others. And I didn't realize why she wasn't participating until one day she told me, I have a hearing aid appointment next week, so I hope that after that I'll be able to actually hear what you're saying. And I was like, wow. I was not looking for that. I was not paying attention to that. And trying to sensitize ourselves to those things that we don't necessarily think about, especially if many of us are younger um, or haven't dealt with some of those barriers to entry that our students face. Um, we have to think more consciously about those and focus on all of the different barriers that we can overcome to get people involved. Um, also, I think that demystifying assumptions is important. If you want people to show up to a mass protest or take action online, you have to make it clear why they're doing that. Some people really enjoy showing up and like yelling and making a big fuss and making signs, like me, that's great. And some people love coming to class and participating and engaging in, in discussions and finishing assignments on time. Others really need to see how those things connect to their own goals. School isn't everyone's goal in and of itself. So drawing those connections and making your assumptions about why work is important and what you expect of work is really key. Mass participation is great, um, but it's really powerful when you combine it with deeper relational organizing work. So this type of work scaffolds the mass participation and also provides a framework for mentorship. So I'll talk about it in two capacities. First, in order to get the most people involved in the classroom, it really helps when you're not the only one trying to get people involved. When you've got some like key people throughout the class who are really engaged and really into the subject matter and come in at 8 a.m. and are like, hey, how's it going? Like, happy Monday, it's a great day. Their peers are gonna be more involved too. And when students see their peers participating and being really engaged, they come along for the ride. This is something that's true in organizing too. If somebody's friend is going to a protest, that friend brings a bunch of people, all these other people who weren't necessarily going to attend to begin with show up. So the way that this is done is by actually engaging more deeply with uh, people who kind of present themselves as leaders. So in organizing, this is anyone who starts to kind of go above and beyond. And in the classroom, I see it as anybody who contacts me outside of class, stops by the podium at the end of lecture, comes to office hours, contacts me via email. 
And it's especially easy to do in office hours because relational organizing is really just about talking to people. Um, in organizing, we sit down for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And the goal of that conversation is to understand what makes somebody tick, why they're there, what their values are, and how those values relate to your goals. It's the exact same thing with students. So when a student comes to my office hours, unless there's a line of 20, like the day before the exam, I try to take a couple minutes and actually figure out who they are. And it's remarkable what a difference this makes, which in a way is kind of disappointing because you realize how few instructors on campus are doing this. And I think that it's especially an important role that we as graduate instructors can play and as younger instructors, because often students connect with us, they see us as role models. And they're a lot more comfortable sometimes talking to us, people who are closer to them in age and experience. So having those conversations and finding out what is driving students enables um, tailoring the classroom experience. And I find that even just having those conversations make those, makes those students more comfortable participating the next time they come to class makes them more involved and they bring their peers along with. A lot of those students also end up coming back for RA positions, doing research work with me, following me to my next class. And that provides an opportunity to mentor students in a really personalized, tailored way. Um, and doing this deep relational work that actually empowers students to understand their role in the university. When they start to see you tailoring your class to meet their needs, students feel that power. They feel like they're playing an important role. And once people start to feel empowered, you don't go back on that. That's something we know in organizing. Empowerment is not something you can scale back from. And the more we empower our students, the more they're able to accomplish their goals. And we can scaffold that work that they're doing. Finally, I want to talk about the role of power. Often we think about power as the ability to make students do something, make other people do something, um, force a politician to vote a certain way, or get the students to actually read the syllabus or staple their paper. But we find out that after you know, the fifth time of saying, I really need you to staple your paper, that power over doesn't necessarily work. Just telling somebody to do something. So in organizing, we think about power with. We think about working with people instead of working to get people to do something that we want them to do. And this is especially important in the classroom because we are here to serve our students and to advance our students' educational goals, not just our own. So once we know about students, once we've talked to them and we understand where they want to go and why these courses are important to them, why they're in this major at this university, we can work with them to construct the classroom environment. And students love that. They want to feel empowered. They want to feel important. And giving up a little bit of our power can be hard as instructors. It's, really easy. it's a lot easier to go into a classroom when we know exactly what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and we can follow the script. And going in with more uncertainty and not quite knowing exactly how the class is going to go can be really scary, especially for people like me who hate public speaking, hate being in front of a crowd. But when we let students lead, amazing things happen. So for example, yesterday I went into my class and they were pretty rowdy. They were having this conversation coming into the class and I realized after a minute that it was actually a conversation about the meaning of life. I am not joking. These students were talking to each other before class about the meaning of life. It's a public speaking class. So the whole point of the class is to get them in a position where they can go into a room and share their ideas with other people. That's the overall learning outcome. What I wanted to accomplish yesterday was spend an hour doing a workshop on their final speech. Instead, I cut that time in half and I said, hey, you all are really into this topic. None of us have an answer. Let's all get up here for 30 seconds. Share your thoughts on the meaning of life. And we spent most of the class doing this impromptu speech at their kind of lead. And it was the best class I've ever had. So when I gave up that power and adjusted my uh, teaching, uh, my lesson plan like in the moment, they saw that I was willing to be flexible and do what they wanted to do. And I was able to tailor what they wanted to do towards the course's learning outcomes. So when we think about power and engaging with students instead of trying to get students to do things, we open up spaces for all their creativity to come into the classroom. And it makes it a lot more fun for everybody. I also find that the papers get stapled a lot more when students feel <laughs> empowered. Um, so this is kind of my view on teaching, why I think that kind of bringing a community organizing philosophy into the classroom can be really important. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have.